Hello, this is Carl Ackerman, the host of History is Here to Help here on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, we are lucky to have drawn someone as far away as Massachusetts, um, the wonderful biographer, Mark Schneider. So, Mark, we welcome you to this uh, Think Tech Hawaii show. And um, uh, my first question to you, uh, with no more further ado, is tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you know, I'm sure you weren't born um, a biographer, uh, so we'd like to know a little bit by uh, your biographical information. Yeah, I'm 75 years old. I uh, grew up on Long Island and went to college at the University of Buffalo during the height of the war in Vietnam and became an anti-war activist uh, as, as an undergraduate and then kind of committed the next decade of my life, or actually two, to uh, social justice issues. And I, I worked on um, uh, Mexican-American uh, justice issues in California and in Texas, where I held various blue-collar jobs, mostly working as a bus driver in San Antonio while helping to organize a national uh, Mexican-American conference on immigration in 1978. Uh, I then moved to Boston and maintained my interest in Latin America and volunteered as a, um, a was very active in the uh, movement against uh, the United States support for the Contras in Nicaragua and for the military uh, in El Salvador. And I went to Nicaragua as a volunteer coffee brigade picker and, uh, you know, during the 1980s and for the next 30 years, I had a regular blue collar job as a railroad worker. And I went back to college in the uh, late 80s, uh, became a, got a PhD and became a historian. And I wrote three books on African-American history and then shifted my interests to uh, the United States and the public and foreign policy. Uh, the two books that we're going to discuss today uh, came out of my concern about the, uh, you know, long-term uh, provincialism of um, American of the American public. And the first uh, subject I chose was Joe Boakley, who is a blue-collar guy with very little education, uh, who became a congressman and later in life got very interested in the, uh, the situation in El Salvador. Well, let me let me um, pause for a second and take you back before we go into Mr. Mokley, or I should say Representative Mokley, uh, who was there forever in uh, Massachusetts as a representative. You know, why biography? I mean, what what, what attracted you to uh, biography as a form of histor historical discourse? Yeah, good question. So, uh, you know, I wrote three uh, traditional history, uh, African-American history books previous to this, uh, that were farther back uh, in the past. Not, you know, um, my dissertation was on the legacy of the abolitionists in Boston during the Jim Crow era. And uh, then I wrote a longer book, uh, I mean, a, a longer book, but on a shorter period, the um, history of the NAACP in the 1920s. Uh, and then uh, another book that's used as a textbook in a uh, series on the 1920s. Now, I had a friend who is a uh, presidential historian, and, uh, you know, we could get together quite a lot, and I could see how much fun he was having. He only did, um, you know, uh, <laughs> presidents who were, were either still alive or recently dead. And, you know, he was doing lots of interviews with living people, and I could see how much fun it was for him and how energized it made him. So I thought I would try my hand um, at this. Uh, and uh, they were, it, it, Mowgli was a perfect character for me. Uh, I had written a bridge book that never got published, uh, that I self-published, um, about um, the American public and foreign policy, focusing on various individuals who were, you know, not necessarily college-educated people, who had some kind of connecting project uh, somewhere else in the world. Uh, and there was no central character in the book, and uh, no publisher was interested in it, and you know, it was kind of a flop. Uh, but Mowgli, um, his, 
you know, it was a bi- it's a biography. You know, it's kind of more interesting. It's focused on one person with an interesting life story. Uh, and uh, so that really jumped out at me. Now, in addition, I was teaching as an adjunct at Suffolk University, where Mowgli had sort of got to law school and had gotten a, a sort of a law degree there, and his papers were there. So it was perfect. Well, you know, this is an important quality. I mean, you found a place where his papers were, so you know that's that's the field day. That I mean, that's half the battle is getting all the all the material. Were you, you know, I should I should ask you this question too before we move on about Mowgli. Um and, and this question is: Was there a particular person besides your friend who, you know, got you interested in biography? You know, um. I was uh, deeply influenced in my own writing by uh, Robert Caro. And, uh, you know, I read The Power Broker and I thought it was the the best biography about Robert Moses. Well, it was about Robert Moses, but it was just so well written. And, you know, I mean, he spent, a, you know, an, an eternity writing that book. But, but were there other things, were there other things that you read that inspired you to write this first uh, biography about Representative Mowgli? Uh, nothing in particular, but, you know, biography is a really compelling uh, way of learning. You call it the spice of history. I think that's great. Uh, it, you know, people love personal stories where you kind of investigate the human being who's involved in what become important enough historical events for somebody to decide to publish a book about them. Uh, so, no, there wasn't any one person in particular. But I always enjoyed reading biography all the way through. I had been an English major as an undergraduate. Uh, you know, and often you, you know, those are always deeply personal stories in novels. So sure. Yeah, there there were other, you know, I have, remember hearing Cairo speak in a historian's uh, conference and you know, it was really terrific. And yeah, that would have been an influence on me too, I'm sure. Um, another question is, and it feels it kind of fills in with your um, or, or alludes to your um, work in Latin America. You know, uh, Mowgli had a commission re El Salvador, and I was wondering, and that seems to have been a you know a major focus of your book. Uh, so, what did he do, and what was that commission about in terms of his work in El Salvador? Well, that was the uh, climax of the book. So, uh, with the Mowgli book, uh, you know, if we're talking kind of technically about crafting a biography. Uh, this had this his life story had the fortunate circumstance of a big climax at the end of his life that really did not have a lot of connection to anything at the beginning. So Mowgli came to the subject of El Salvador uh, only somewhat incidentally. Uh, during the beginning of the Salvador War, all of the Central America activists, I was in that crowd, typically would go and visit their congressmen and say, look, here's what we'd look. We'd like you to do something to stop aid to El Salvador. And uh, the uh, activists who visited Joe Mowgli, you know, kind of expected him to say, yeah, yeah, you know, you guys are okay. Sure, yeah, I'll do something and blow him off. But he didn't. He had a quality that was rooted in his earlier life where first of he, he didn't like bullies. He had grown up, you know, in a tough neighborhood himself, and he'd, you know, been in some physical fights, you know, as a kid, and he'd been a boxer. Uh, you know, he could kind of sense this, even if his um, concerns were very locally based in the beginning of his legislative uh, and congressional career. Uh, so he did, and he had this young kid working for him, 20-something, guy right out of college named Jim McGovern, who's now a congressman and has been for many years, was very interested in the subject. So we had Jim McGovern go and look into this. Now, when I was beginning the book, I thought to myself, you know, if this was Jim McGovern's deal and Mowgli just said, yeah, you go do this and let me know what you're doing, I wasn't going to write the book. But it quickly dawned on me that, no, this was heartfelt uh, for Joe Mowgli. So the first, he made three major contributions to um, ending the war in El Salvador and getting justice. The first one was he a 10-year-long campaign 
a different name for the ten year before that. But um, in other words, people who are here in the United States who had fled and entered the country illegally could be deported. Mowgli wanted them to have temporary protective status so that during the war they wouldn't be deported um, if um, you know, they were uh, caught. Uh, and it took 10 years to accomplish that over lots and lots of obstacles. You've got to remember all this stuff has to go through the House, through the Senate, and he built its past, goes to the conference committee. Very complicated. He did get that done. Uh, the um, second one was that he, as a result of this work, in, 19, in November of 1989, six Jesuit priests, five of them Spanish, and their two uh, a, a, a custodians were murdered by the military. This was a long and complicated story. Uh, and I had several chapters on this. This was really kind of the main thing that Mowgli did. Uh, the uh, uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush administration initially went along with the Salvadoran military story that the guerrillas did this. Okay, Mowgli knew, everybody knew right away this was not true. Um, they had been, you know, uh, they the military who did, you know, do this crime, planted some fake evidence that would indicate that it was the guerrillas, that, that they used an AK-47, you know, that killed them, that kind of thing. Now, uh, the United States was paying $85 million a year to support the Salvadoran military, and the House appropriated that money. Gary Studs, who had been... Uh, on the Foreign Relations Committee. Mowgli, by the way, was on the Rules Committee. You know, if you're on the Rules Committee, you don't have another assignment. Studs had been previously on the Foreign Affairs Committee, had a deep interest in this. Well, the Speaker of the House at that time, Tom Foley, and said, we have to set up a Speaker's Committee to see that the money that we are giving these people, that they are doing a fair investigation, which of course they weren't, of the murders of the Jesuits. And he said, the guy to lead this is Joe Mowgli. Now, Mowgli, unlike most liberals in the House, had uh, cachet with centrists because on social issues, he was one himself. He was a religious Catholic. He was not in favor of abortion. Um, you know, the, that's who he was, you know. Um, and uh, he could talk to pretty much every Democratic con Congress members. So the speaker appointed him to head this committee. And they went to El Salvador. They conducted some really tough interviews, both with the military and with people in the military who knew what happened, wanted to talk, but were afraid that they'd get killed. If they did. And they had bunch of secret meetings with these people. At one point, they had a guy, a guy in El Salvador, who was protected by the American embassy, the ambassador, a man named William Walker. Um, and this guy could themselves, but, you know, who knew what happened? You know, a lot of criminal investigations work this way. Uh, at one point, uh, this man, Lionel Gomez had a Jim McGovern and, a, and one of Studs, a guy called Bill Woodward, swim out to a place of water where the guy would be dead, uh, who who had, had done this. Now, Mowgli was never able to prove any of it. At the end of the establishment of this commission, after two years, they issued a report. Uh, report um, that pointed in the direction of what had happened. In El Salvador, there was a fake trial of six or eight, I think, um, lower ranking military guys who had clearly been promised that um, they were going to take the fall for this. They'd go to jail for a short time and then get um, released, uh, which is basically what happened. The perpetrators of the crime 
were identified by Mobley in a later report. Uh, they, um, a, a year later, they, there was the United Nations Commission, which wrote the same report that Mowgli wrote, saying that it was the heads of the military who ordered this assassination. Clearly, no low-ranking colonel, which is the guy who took the fall for this, was going to do this on his own. Uh, it ends a very dramatic uh, story that would make a great uh, pot boiler. Mowgli had one other uh, contribution, which is that he helped to end the war by going into guerrilla-held territory on his own, on his own initiative, and it's signaling by that uh, means to the guerrillas, the war was still on, that <coughs> he had some power, he was in a position to use it to um, cut off all the aid to the military, and the guerrillas read this signal. Uh, peace talks began. This all happened. The murder of, of the Jesuits, which I consider one of the great crimes of the 20th century, was overshadowed by the fall of the Berlin Wall at exactly the same time. So, um, uh, you know, the, uh, ultimately a peace agreement was reached in January of 1993, and uh, Joe Mowgli made a great contribution uh, to this. Well, you know, what's interesting is that you, um, you know, you, you, you kind of transitioned into your other biography by mentioning um, his name, um, uh, the other representative that you wrote about. And so do you want to talk about him for just a bit? Uh, uh, because uh, this is another example of, um, you know, your, your uh, biographical intent. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I made a couple of, gave a couple of talks, you know, typically at libraries you know, uh, about the Mowgli book. And at one of them, a guy came up to me and said, well, why don't you write a good biography of Gary Stutz? And my first thought was, no, I'm not doing that. Um, <laughs> you know, the story of his life was a, a, a gay man who came out of the classic while he was in Congress. And I thought, you know, look, I've written books about African American history. This one, you know, I'm going to get things wrong. And then I thought about it a little more and I thought, no. No, oh, I could do this. And so I did. Uh, Studs, so um, uh, the circumstances here were somewhat different in that Studs had written his own memoir and his, hus his husband was still alive. And his husband walked me through a lot of uh, Gary Studs' life and uh, pointed me in the direction of people to interview, you know, and I uh, did that. I think I'll take just a, a second to kind of digress here you know, about the process of writing biographies uh, about people who are recently deceased. Typically, you're going to be talking to the people who worked for them who were that person's friends. And the biographer has to be careful not to produce a hagiography in which you just kind of go, yeah, he's a great guy. Here's another story about this great guy. Um, you know, you got kind of have to uh, keep your guard up. Um, you know, but this is compounded typically by the typical problem that most biographers choose subjects that they like, which was really true for me <laughs> in both these cases. Now, um, so yes, so there was a link uh, between these people, but their storylines were very, very different. Studs was a cosmopolitan person more like me than Mowgli, although, you know, personally in my own life, I really did work for the railroad for 30 years selling train tickets. So I had a little bit of the locally based working class person too, that a lot of the people who worked for Mowgli could sense about me. Um, but Studs, you know, was, you know, he's a reader. You know, he'd gone to Yale. Uh, he had uh, worked in the State Department. He'd been a history teacher at a school, uh, you know, at an elite school. Uh, and he ran for Congress, but then he won again in 72 without having any background in politics. He had the, the part, the, the, his background in politics was a little bit interesting in that in 1968, he'd been a uh, history teacher at St. Paul's in Concord. And he supported um, McCarthy, Gene McCarthy, in the presidential primary. And it was Studs who kind of convinced Gene McCarthy 
to really run that he could do well in McCarthy in uh, the New Hampshire primary. And McCarthy had not decided to do that yet. So that was a pretty big deal. And that that it kind of did show studs that he had some chops as a political organizer. Uh, and nobody thought Studs had a chance in any of his elections. Everybody thought Mowgli had a chance in, in you know, in, in running for Congress. But um, it was the war in Vietnam that tipped Studs over the top because he was the only one who featured that in his election campaign. Now, when he uh, won election in 1972, you know, you take office in January of 73, and that's when the war in Vietnam ended. So Studs now, you know, the issue that he had run on wasn't an issue, but he very quickly understood that the key issue in his district, which comprised uh, Cape Cod, the South Shore of Massachusetts, and New Bedford, which is America's largest fishing port, uh, was the sea and conservation and uh, the fishing industry. Studs, to get elected, had a, he had this preternatural language ability learned to speak Portuguese, which is what a lot of people in New Bedford still spoke then, especially the fishermen. And it made them really popular with those guys and their families. So um, he focused right away on the biggest problem that the fishermen faced. There had been a transformation in the industry in that factory fishing mushroomed during the 60s. The United States did not do that because it didn't have an industrial policy that fostered it, but all the other countries that fished did. So Russia China, Russia, and Japan in particular fished in what would later become American waters with these huge factory trawling operations that sucked the fish out of the sea. And uh, studs got a 200 mile limit passed Right away, he was very popular. It uh, lasted, you know, for the whole beginnings, first 10 years of his uh, career uh, in Congress. But that's not the real story. or That's not the reason people remember Gary Stutz today. Uh, he was gay. He hid it all the way throughout his whole life. He buried it deep down inside him. He um, suppressed all his erotic urges. And when they came out, they came out in the wrong places. So when he was elected to Congress, oddly enough, he wasn't, his private life was more private than it was when he had been in a community. And he began to uh, attempt to seduce congressional pages, typically 16 and 17 year old boys. Uh, his staff members told him, you better not do this, you gotta stop it. And it, he took one of them with him as his driver to Portugal. Uh, that guy never raised a complaint against Studs when they came back from the trip. That guy told Studs, look, that was fun, but I don't want to do this anymore. Goodbye. And uh, Studs forgot about it. That happened in 1973. Now, 10 years later, uh, several congressional pages came forward complaining that they had been homosexually harassed, air quotes. The Congress set up an investigation into this. They found that there was nothing to it. But they found that there was a sitting congressman, a Republican named Crane, who was having an affair ongoing with a 17-year-old girl. And they were about to release that report when they kind of figured this is not going to look good. It's a Democratic-controlled Congress can't we find somebody on the Democratic side? And they had heard some rumors about somebody somewhere 10 years ago taking a page to Portugal. They kept pressing. They tracked it down. They found the page. They dragged him in, kicking and screaming. He said, no, nothing bad happened to me. I'm not complaining against anybody. But finally, they got him to confess that it was Gary Studs who had taken him to Portugal. And they brought... Um, uh, censure charges um, against uh, both men, uh, reprimand charges, actually, against both men. Uh, Newt Gingrich got up in the back. He was a backbencher. Nobody heard of him and said, that's no good. You got to kick both these guys out. 
And so uh, that position censures the mid-ground. Congress voted to censor them both. Now, the climax to Gary Studs' career really came in the middle of it in 1980. This, so this broke in 1983, and now Studs had a big decision to make. Uh, he had confessed, you know, he, he admitted that he had done what he had done, but he claimed in a speech in congressional floor that it wasn't wrong. But now he had to decide if he was going to run again, and he did. A lot of people told Suds, you're going to lose. Do not do this. You're getting nothing but pain out of this. And he went forward and he ran and he won. Uh, against a Democratic Party primary challenger, um, who made this the only issue. So this was they made him the first openly gay congressperson, and that was really a big turning point in his career. Now, from a biographer's point of view, what happens when the climax of your story comes in the middle? You're then left with another 12 years of basically, you know, anti-climax. He did a lot of interesting things after this, mostly having to do with the fishing industry, um, you know, but uh, it posed a kind of narrative challenge uh, that I didn't face, you know, with the Mowgli book, the climax came at the end. But I hope readers found the remaining chapters interesting. You know, your your point about um, no hagiography is, uh, is, is an important one. And I think that, you know, even if you admire someone, you can point out, and I think you can do it nicely. I mean, in this latter case, I'm not sure you could do it nicely. Um, I tried to shoot. point out um, errors and what choices the the yeah. uh, polit the political person um, uh, had in front of them. Right. I tried to show this from every so point of view. Let me um, just ask in concluding, in, in concluding sort of today, what I'd like to do is just to ask you uh, to make an overall commentary um, about the enjoyment or non-enjoyment of of your biography writing, because you began our discussion by saying, hey, you know, I have a friend and he seems to really enjoy this. So I tried it. So how do you feel about that? And do you have something else in the works or is it is it is it now past uh, prime and things like that? Um, what, what do you have to say? I about this deeply one? enjoyed writing both books. It was a real pleasure to write both books. I love the process of interviewing people who remembered these important historic events. Uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And uh, just one more thing, just running a little bit over time, um, and and that is, you know, um, in in the process of writing, um, can, can you describe just a bit about how that works? Is it is it in that it looks like maybe a basement that you're in right now, or in a special room? I noticed that you have the the uh, doors drum set behind you, um, but uh, I'm wondering, is do you have a special place to write, or is it all over the place, or is it is it is it you know a special uh, office that you go to. I mean, you 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 know. Um, again, going back to Robert Caro, I I, I um, read his book about uh, historical writing, and he um, said that he had an office that he went to. I think connected to the New York Public Library, if I'm not mistaken. But um, how do you how did you write specifically, and where did you write? Uh, I only write right here in my study. Uh, yeah, the drum set is mine. I'm, I'm a little bit, but I still play. Uh, and, and my the way I I work, which you know I'm sure everybody does it differently, is I uh, did the interviews in order of the life story. Uh, I have friends who told me, no, don't do it that way. Interview the oldest people first. <laughs> uh, so I uh, wrote, do the interviews, write a chapter, interview more people, write a chapter, and then of course revise at the end. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, this has been absolutely um, wonderful. And I just wanted to leave you with the last lines if you wanted to address our audience in any way. Uh, well, biography is a great read. So I encourage uh, uh, the readers and the, the writers in your audience, yeah, go ahead, go do it. It's, it's more fun than archival work. Uh, although, you know, we're in a biography, you have to do the archival work. Uh, and certainly if you're writing a biography about someone who is long gone and which you cannot do uh, interviews, um, you know, the archival work is the way you're going to move your storyline uh, forward. 
Um, but it's a lot of fun to write. Uh, but, you know, to, you know, a little, probably uh, more intriguing than working your way through the census and writing those social histories that win all the awards at the Organization of American Historians. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's well, fun. This is a, a great way to end. And, you know, uh, the title of the show was uh, Biography is the Spice of Life. And apparently it is a great spice in Mark Schneider's life. Thank you, Anna Huiho. Mahalo from History is Here to Help. Thanks very much, Carl.